Okay, welcome back to the last session of this conference here today. We have two more papers coming, very topical papers. And, you know, they're going to, the first one now is going to look into the future. The first one is about predicting GDP and, and, you know, why we think we can predict it. And the second one will look into the past, uh, actually going back to 1500. So within a little bit more than one and a half hours, we're going to spend 500 and more years of, mm -hmm. of, of data. Uh, that's the last thing before we then close and, and, and can all go for lunch. So we start off with you, Camilia Mino Yu uh, from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta with a paper on why does the yield curve predict GDP growth, the role of banks. The floor is yours. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, this is a joint paper with Andre Schneider and Min Wei from the Federal Reserve Board. The paper is titled, Why Does the Yield Curve Predict GDP Growth? We're going to examine the role of banks. And this work, being, uh, with us being affiliated with the Fed, uh, is subject to the usual disclaimer. So we are motivated by the following fact. The yield curve has been an enduring predictor of GDP growth. But where this predictive power comes from, um, it is not quite clear. On the one hand, or one possible explanation, is that um, the yield curve reflects investors' aggregations of their impressions about the future state of the economy. For instance, if investors expect a slowdown in the economy, then the central bank would respond to that slowdown by lowering interest rate, short term rates. And we know that short term rates affect long term rates, so that would mean a lowering of long term rates, which would lower the yield curve. Now, if the yield curve is an aggregation of investors' expectations of future growth, then the yield curve and expected growth would be casually related. But it could also be that um, long-term rates respond to changes in the term premium. In that case, it's possible that the yield curve predicts future growth with a causal element. And it is this potential causal channel shown in the second part of the first, equation, uh, of the first uh, line that is our interest. In particular, we want to examine if banks play a role in this potential chan causal channel by which the slope through the term premium fluctuations may affect future growth. So to give you the full chain of causation, uh, we're interested in how fluctuations in the term premium affect uh, the slope. In turn, the slope affects expected bank profits and lending. And finally, that increased bank credit affects GDP growth. Uh, for the um, chains in this causation link, uh, or the, rather the links in this causation chain A and C, there are many papers, our focus will be on uh, link B, the um, causality running from changes in the slope via the term premium on bank profits and lending. So the intuition in a snapshot is that higher term premium implies higher expected profits on maturity transformation on the core business model of banks incentivizing lending. So our paper is uh, naturally related to at least two literatures. One is the predictive power of the yield curve for, e for GDP growth. Unlike this literature, we emphasize the role of banks. We zoom in on the role of the term premium um, and document a specific expected profitability channel. Secondly, we relate to the bank uh, literature on banks' exposures to interest rate risk that typically focuses on short-term uh, interest rates. Here we look at banks' exposures to interest rate slope risks. So let me start with some very simple motivating ev evidence with aggregate data. This is just a, a number of time series regressions. In these time series regressions that run uh, all the way back to the mid 70s or the mid 80s, we relate the term spread to uh, four quarter ahead GDP growth, bank loan growth, net interest margins and ROE, so two profitability metrics in the, uh, the columns 1, 3, 5, 7. And then in the alternate columns, we decompose the term spread into the term premium and expectations. We always control for, for what happens at the short end of the yield curve. And we see here positive correlations between the term spread and uh, uh, as well as the term premium component of the term spread and four quarter ahead G real GDP growth credit as well as bank profits. So this tells us, tells us that perhaps there is that causal channel in the data, but of course to establish uh, something a little bit more credible, we need to uh, take identification seriously. So before we move to the data and to the main results, let me give some intuition about what's going on here. 
Um, we develop a model in the paper to sort of organize our thinking around the topic. This is a partial equilibrium dynamic banking model. Uh, where banks take leverage positions in assets, in particular loans that are exposed to term premium and interest rate shocks. And there are two insights that follow from the model. One about the level effect of the term premium on bank lending, and the other one about the, a differential effect. The first insight is that an increase in the term premium implies greater expected profits on maturity transformation. That is, an increase in banks' expected return on wealth. When we take this to the data intuitively, the expected return on wealth is the return on equity, which is profits over equity, so profits times leverage. So expected return on wealth increases in the term premium and in bank leverage. The level uh, prediction of the model is that an increase in the term premium by raising expected profits on maturity transformation will lower the financial constraints of the bank because the bank, by making more profits, will ease its capital, uh, will, will build capital and therefore ease its financial constraints, boosting its incentive to lend. Uh, the differential uh, uh, prediction of the model is that the expected return on wealth increasing in the term premium and in bank leverage from that simple ROE is a function of the increasing function of the term premium because of profits times leverage. That means that a leveraged bank should be in a better position to take advantage of an increase in the term premium. A more leveraged bank should exhibit a stronger response to an increase in the term premium relative to a less leveraged bank. So I can take two testable implications to the data. First, the banks will respond to a rise in the term premium by increasing lending, in particular the supply of new loans. And so importantly here, we're gonna have to somehow uh, empirically shut down any effects of the term premium on loan demand. And secondly, more leveraged banks should exhibit stronger response to term premium fluctuations, that's the differential effect. So we have two tasks. We have the task of establishing or, or documenting in the data a level and a differential effect that would be consistent with the model. So let's move on to identification. I've already given a flavor of the identification challenges. The first one is a typical omitted variable bias. The endogeneity issue here is that growth expectations affect both the slope or the term premium and bank lending. So uh, this is a typical you know, omitted variable bias. Both the left-hand side and the right-hand side may be driven by growth expectations of, of investors and of agents in the economy. Um, so we need to find exogenous variation in the term premium. We need to orthogonalize it with respect to expected um, uh, future economic outlook. And the second challenge is to separate credit supply from credit demand effects. And in particular here, we're gonna deploy some loan level data that will allow us to hold credit demand at the firm level fixed. So the identification straight strategies we will deploy are manifold. There are maybe two or three. So we're gonna give you a portfolio of evidence that hopefully corroborates uh, the uh, testable implications of the model. And in a sense, I invite you to pick your favorite and to criticize the one that you don't find convincing. The first one is that for the term premium itself, which is a non-observed variable, we're gonna have estimates from a well-established model, um, we use high-frequency term premium shocks, uh, so defined in a way that is reminiscent of how we define monetary policy shocks, short-rate shocks. Then we're gonna have an instrumental variable for changes in the term premium. So in alternative specifications, we're gonna use the foreign official holdings of US treasuries. These are foreign central bank holdings of US treasuries, normalized by US GDP. They are inversely related to, in the time series, with uh, inversely related to the term premium. And the identifying assumption is that these holdings are orthogonal on the, on the US economic outlook. Okay. Um, and rather they are driven by central banks, you know, in, international reserve management, considerations related to exchange rate management, and considerations therefore unrelated to the US economic outlook. Then we use the taper tantrum of the summer of 2013 as an event study because the taper tantrum gave rise to a remarkable and fairly persistent rise in the term premium that one might argue was quite unanticipated. And finally, as I mentioned before, we're gonna deploy some loan level data to try and control for uh, loan demand in a way that is quite standard in the empirical banking literature with, with firm time fixed effects, while at the si same time um, controlling for two additional variables. So even if you're not convinced by any of these identification strategies, we have one more um, uh, strategy 
uh, in our sleeve, which is to control for bank level growth expectations directly for those banks that report in the blue chip uh, surveys, they report their one year ahead GDP or CPI forecasts. Um, and finally, we sort of control for the bank standard bank lending channel by interacting uh, high frequency monetary policy shocks, so shocks for the short rate with a number of balance sheet variables in, in all of our specifications or just directly in the time series specifications. Okay. So without further ado, let me go straight into the data and the results. The data come from the US Credit Register. These are big words. The Credit Register is actually a slice of the true Credit Register in the US, but it covers three quarters of the banking sector loans. This is the Y14 regulatory data. Uh, these are loan level or bank firm level loan exposures that we observe on a quarterly, as quarterly snapshots since 2013 um, until today. They are reported by the large stress-tested banks, and so we only uh, look at the 15 banks for which we have data on growth expectations from the blue chip surveys, because it's so critical to control for those expectations. Um, an advantage of the data is that it includes a lot of privately held firms. Um, to altogether, the firms account for 60% of non-financial business. There are a lot of bank-dependent firms in there. Then we have the US call report, and then we have the IV that we draw from alternative data sources. The most important element here is the term premium, an unobserved quantity. We take estimates from the Kim Wright uh, 2005 term premium model or term structure model that was fitted to US Treasury yields since 1990. And the way we measure high frequency shocks of the term premium is to look at changes in the Kim Wright term premium on FOMC event days and then aggregate those changes at the quarterly level. So let me go straight into the results. I'm gonna have bank level data results and loan level data results. So in the bank level, we are gonna estimate the level effect of the term premium. So there's not many options here. Here we either use shocks with OLS, that's column three and six, or we use an IV, columns two and five, or we just do a simple OLS. Do not compare the estimates across columns, so they are not comparable. But what's important here is that we see a positive association of the term premium, controlling for expectations, controlling for changes in the short rate, a positive association with loan growth with and without credit lines. Now, um, of course, it's difficult to control in these regressions for loan demand. Um, one very simple way is to put in bank MSA fixed effects to the extent to which uh, banks um, are exposed to local markets, you know, the MSAs where they operate and they, they do local lending, then those would absorb some demand shocks. But we'll do a little bit more in the loan level data. Okay, so let's move to the loan level data and let me show you two sets of results. First, we're gonna do the event study of the taper tantrum and then zoom out from the taper tantrum period to the entire credit registry to see if we can establish more general patterns. So let's look at the taper tantrum. What happened then is that in May uh, of 2013, uh, former uh, Reserve, Federal Reserve Chair Ben Bernanke gave a speech in the Q and, and in the Q&A um, session following his congressional testimony, he mentioned or he noted that the Fed would start tapering, it would slow down the pace of asset purchases at some future date without being precise about the date. And what happened uh, subsequently is that market participants interpreted this speech as um, injecting quite a bit of uncertainty about monetary policy and the term premium rose uh, sharply and uh, based on the Kim, Kim uh, Wright model, um, it, that rise was pretty sustained over a few quarters. So we're gonna zoom in on the quarters before and after this significant rise in the term premium. We're gonna think of it as unanticipated and we're gonna compare lending outcomes at banks before and after this significant rise in the, post, uh, in the term premium in a very standard diff in diff specification. Here it is. So we're gonna regress loan outcomes at the bank firm level uh, over a period of three to five quarters around the taper tantrum, um, not one and two because it takes time for le banks lending decisions to respond to any financial or real shock, um, and not more than five quarters because then we allow, by extending the window too much, we allow maybe contamination effects from some other events in the economy. So we look at loan outcomes in this window as a function of the bank's ex ante leverage capital ratio interacted with a post dummy for the post taper tantrum period. Very standard diff in diff. 
two or three critical ingredients in this specification are that first we control for bank level one year ahead GDP growth expectations or forecasts from the blue chip surveys both before and after the taper tantrum. So clearly with the taper tantrum, with the new information they received from this speech, banks' anticipations of where the economic outlook was going uh, may have changed. So we have those, that variable in level and interacted with post. And then we also control for firm quarter fixed effects, the, the, which, which allows us to draw identification from comparing banks with different exposure, if you will, to, uh, the, tape, tape, to the term premium, the term premium rise from the taper tantrum episode. Uh, so to, to um, exploit heterogeneous exposure to the term premium in terms of leverage and compare the lending of banks with different degrees of ex-ante leverage to the same firm and in the same quarter and see how those decisions differ. That's where the identification comes from. So the results speak pretty much consistently or they corroborate the differential um, uh, implications, the implications of the model in regards to the differential effects of bank leverage. The negative coefficients in the first three columns tell us that more leveraged banks reacted more, they increased lending even more than less leveraged banks after the taper tantrum compared to before and compared to less leveraged banks. Similarly, they also de decreased loan spreads more than other banks. So we have strong evidence of differential effects by initial leverage. And like I mentioned before, we control for a lot of different potential confounders here. So we're fairly confident that mm, the evidence suggests that banks um, adjusted their lending decisions on both the extensive and the intensive margin following the uh, taper, the taper tantrum, um, and as a function, the, the response was heterogeneous according to their leverage level. Okay, so now let's zoom out to the entire credit registry and see if what we've identified by way of patterns in the taper tantrum episode generalizes to the entire period 2013 to 2019. So we run, the, now this is not a diff in diff anymore, it's a very simple like, sort of panel regression, if you will, but again at the loan level, where we relay the, capital in, the lagged capital ratio in interaction with term premium shocks to the extensive and intensive margin lending decisions of the banks. And again, we find that more leveraged banks increase lending more. They are more likely to give new loans or for accepted loans, they are more likely to give larger loans than less leveraged banks and similarly to decrease spreads. So here we control for demand with firm quarter fixed effects where I'm hoping that these are somewhat convincing results that they're picking up the credit supply effect we have quantity and, sp and, uh, in, and prices also going in opposite directions. And importantly, we take every single bank control and interact it with term premium shocks, with expectations and with a short rate. So it's a pretty demanding specification. Now, something I have not mentioned so far is that in this uh, somewhat uh, black box of uh, bank controls, a critical bank control is the share of securities to assets. And the reason why we think it's critical is because um, if you're familiar with um, some of the recent quantitative easing literature, um, uh, an important channel of transmission of quantitative easing um, activities, and in particular the flattening of the yield curve that they achieve, uh, the, the lowering of term premia that they achieve is through valuation effects. They're also called windfall gains or windfall effects. Um, basically, with interest rates going down, the value of, of the securities um, uh, held by banks increases, and that is a phenomenon that Brunner Meyer refers to as stealth recapital recapitalization. It's been documented uh, both for Europe and for the US. And so controlling for that valuation channel is very important. It goes in the opposite direction of our channel, uh, but it is very important to control for it. Okay. So uh, how can um, uh, banks take um, more interest rate risk exposure in face of a positive term premium shock? Two ways. They could increase the maturities of the loans that they make while, while holding leverage constant, or they could increase leverage while holding maturities constant, or they could do a little bit of everything. And we have evidence for both types of um, reactions. I want to show you here the one regarding extension of maturities. More leveraged banks increase the maturity of their new loans even more than less leveraged banks after a positive term premium shocks. We see this for a number of alternative ways of looking at loan maturity. So um, to wrap up the empirics, I'm going to speak about um, uh, the impacts of the term premium on 
uh, bank profitability. So this is the last table. And so uh, here for, for this exercise, we go back to the long-term bank panel and we have our three identification strategies, OLS, OLS with term premium shocks and IV. And we relate the term premium to net interest margins and return on equity, we see a strong positive association. Again, this is suggestive that the channel by, by which uh, banks increase lending, and in turn this has positive real effects, uh, the channel is worked in the face of a positive term, premium shock works through uh, bank profitability, increased bank profitability. Of course, it's expected profitability, so we're looking at four quarter ahead uh, outcomes. Okay? So the economic magnitudes are reasonable. Um, I'm going to just talk about the level effects of the term premium. A one standard deviation increase in the term premium, uh, which roughly 50 bips. Uh, raises loan growth by 1.1 percentage points, bank NIMS by four basis points, bank ROE by 32 basis points. Uh, the numbers are meaningful, they are not negligible, they're not um, implausibly large either. Okay. So um, I do have a little bit of time and I want to run through a number of additional results and robustness checks. I think a very natural question will be about the identifying assumption on our instrument our instrument, recall, is the holdings of U.S. Treasuries by foreign central banks, and the identifying assumption there is that those holdings, the demand for the foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries from foreign central banks, is, is uh, orthogonal on the U.S. economic outlook. You may not believe that much. You may say, well, the, for China especially, the Chinese credit, uh, business cycle is correlated with with the U.S. Uh, cycle, and so um, that that identifying assumption may be tenuous. We can drop the China's holdings from US treasuries, from the construction of the instrument, and the results go through. We have placebo tests for the taper tantrum, but perhaps more importantly, the taper tantrum came on the back of m several waves of quantitative easings by the Fed, which had um, increased the level of bank reserves. And we may all have different opinions about how bank reserves affect the supply of loans. The empirical literature is um, somewhat um, undecided on that. But controlling for bank reserves, for that huge accumulation of bank reserves before the taper tantrum, does not seem to affect uh, the, the results either. Um, I motivated the work by saying that we want to look at the channel by which the slope affects real GDP growth. And so in all of these credit regressions, you may ask, are there real effects? And indeed, although I'm not showing it, there are real effects after the taper tantrum. As I mentioned, in the credit registry, we have a lot of bank-dependent firms, and those bank-dependent firms that are more reliant on leveraged, leveraged lenders tend to have better real effects, in particular higher investment rates after the taper tantrum than other firms. So there are real effects after the taper, taper tantrum. There are bank-dependent firms in, in, in the US, among, especially among the privately held ones. Um, and, and they, they do see that there is an impact on growth from, um, from better availability of credit. And finally, I have some additional mechanism evidence. As I mentioned, there are different ways by which banks can take more interest rate risk. One is to leverage up, the other one, and hold maturities constant, or the other one is to take more um, duration risk while holding um, leverage constant, and we have evidence for both, both of these channels. Okay. So, um, I will wrap up by discussing, sort of kind of circling back a little bit to the quantitative easing uh, uh, literature, because um, I want to give some flavor of some policy implications for, the, for this work. And so I think it's important to note that we don't have different interest rate regimes in the model. The model is estimated, is calibrated for normal interest rates, above, not at the zero or lower bound. And so in order to very carefully um, speak about um, quantitative easing implications, what happens, what happens um, uh, at the zero lower bound, we would have to uh, you know, do the impulse response functions for interest rates at zero, conditional on interest rates at zero uh, versus otherwise. So, um, and, and one difficulty with that, as we think through the policy implications, is that in a zero interest rate environment, um, uh, you know, uh, bank behaviors may change. One reason is that profitability is just generally depressed, and so banks may try to take more risk. They may develop stronger appetite for this. They may try to go up the duration ladder, the credit ladder, and there's quite a bit of evidence to that effect. In fact, um, this is what in the literature is referred to as portfolio rebalancing effects. Um, in some work with Margarita Botero and co-authors, we show that when negative interest rates were uh, implemented in that uh, environment of depressed 
net interest margins, banks took more risk. They lent more, but especially to riskier firms. And they swapped out of low yielding assets for, for loans and other high yielding assets, or higher yielding assets. And um, the, the other, so this is one consideration that kind of gives us pause and a little bit of caution in thinking about the policy implications of the work. Uh, but I would like to um, say that our work draws our attention to a channel that suggests countervailing or counteracting events, effects relative to the valuation channel of quantitative easing. Um, as documented empirically in Chakraborty et al, Acharya et al, Rodniansky and Darmoni, um, we control for this channel. We don't do a horse race. We don't try to quantify one channel over the vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other. We would need to do more work to say something more confidently about that. But at least intuitively, our bank profitability channel suggests counteracting effects. And therefore, it has implications for how we think about uh, ba balance sheet management, about you know, calibrating asset purchases, and the pace of quantitative tightening. So, to conclude, I hope I have convinced you that we've, um, un, un, uh, we have dug out a, an expected bank profitability channel by which the slope of the yield curve affects economic activity through bank lending. Uh, our strategy was multifold in terms of identification. We threw a lot of data at this qu question, and the headline result is that there is indeed a strong positive link between term premium shocks and bank lending with possible effects on GDP growth, and therefore this causal channel offers some insight as to why the yield curve is such a strong predictor of GDP growth. All right. Camelia, thank you very much. Uh, perfect timing. Um, and the discussion is Clancy Happens here from the ECB. The floor is yours. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. So, this is really a, a very interesting paper. It was a was a very nice, uh, very nice read. So, um, I think Camilia did a did a great job in in uh, making abundantly clear that what this paper is really about is the question: Why does the slope of the yield curve um, is typically associated with uh, with future gro growth? Or put differently, why is a steeper yield curve typically associated with higher future growth? And vice versa, why is an inverted yield curve often seen as a good predictor of, of upcoming recessions? Now, the traditional answer to that would, I think, very often be something along the lines of, well, this is basically spurious correlation, because what the yield curve captures in the end is changes in, in monetary policy and the views of, uh, of markets and market participants regarding future economic conditions, regarding future uh, short-term interest rates. So obviously, it's going to tell you something about uh, about future economic grade, uh, growth. Now, this paper uh, takes a bit of a different stance. It's not going to say like it's not going to say at all. It's not going to say that this uh, spurious correlation is not there. No, it's just going to argue that uh, there's something more to it, and, and that's their expected bank profitability channel. So their their point is going to be that a higher term premium leads to higher growth via this expected bank profitability channel, and they'll proceed in two steps in their analysis. So first they are going to decompose uh, long-term rates in an expected uh, short-term rates uh, part and, and a term premium, so the remuneration that uh, investors get for holding on long-term uh, investments, long-term bond in this case. And, and this is nothing, nothing novel. They've just taken an on-the-shelf model to do this decomposition, and there's nothing wrong with that. And the real novelty about the paper is really in this, in this expected bank profitability channel, which, which is going to tell you that an increase in the term premium will lead to an increase in the expected interest margin uh, for banks, which will uh, reduce uh, financial constraints for banks, uh, increase their bank credit supply, and in this way lead to more economic growth. So if you think about it, this is kind of a, a big thing, because it implies that the slope of the yield curve doesn't simply reflect but actually causes changes in future economic activities. So this is very different from um, how one traditionally tends to think about uh, this, uh, this relationship. And that in itself makes this a very interesting, a very thought-provoking uh, uh, paper. So it's definitely worth your time reading it. Now, as with every empirical analysis, of, of course, it's going to be very challenging to establish this uh, type of uh, causality. And I think this is even more true for, uh, for this paper than for others exactly because of the fact that your yield curve is so correlated to so many economic factors uh, out there. So a lot of my uh, present uh, discussion today will focus uh, on that. But overall, I think this is really an excellent paper, so a very nice read, very much enjoyed reading it. Uh, and what I'll try to do during the discussion is play a bit of devil's advocate regarding the mechanism you have in mind and, uh, and regarding parts of the empirical analysis. So let's look, at, look a bit closer at this, uh, at this mechanism. So 
what their mechanism is going to say is that an increase in the term pre premium will lead to an increase in uh, the expected net uh, interest margin for banks. And that's simply because there's the assumption that banks are funding themselves short term and they're lending long term. So this will increase their expected profits, reduce their financial constraints, increase credit supply, and, and in this way have a, have a positive impact on economic growth. So uh, the last part being a sort of uh, standard uh, bank credit uh, type of channel. Um, and this is somewhat related to, to a recent literature on the yield curve and bank profits, but uh, the first question when I, when I saw the channel that really came to mind is, okay, but why the strong focus here on the term premium and not simply the slope of the yield curve for this mechanism? Because in the end, if you're, gonna talk, if you're talking about net interest margins for banks, what they're interested in is the spread between uh, long-term and short-term uh, rates. And this is something that isn't really uh, clarified or, or that, that isn't really clear in the current version uh, of the paper. Now, I think one, one way to think about it is that what they mainly have in mind is, is interest margin and profits on, on new loans. So, of course, if the slope in the yield curve increases due to an increase in uh, expected short-term rates, then this implies that given that these loans are funded by rolling over uh, short-term short debt, that your funding cost also increases. So in the end, your net interest margin uh, doesn't change in, uh, uh, in, in this case. And that's why it's important to focus on the, on the term premium here. I'm not sure whether that's the exact mechanism that, that you have in mind, um, but if it, if it is this, then it's also, I think, very important to, to realize that uh, via the same type of channel, um, of course, a bank also has a loans outstanding, a large loan book outstanding. And for these outstanding loans, if the expected short-term rates are going up, this means the expected margin on your loan book is going down, which reduces profits and could have the exact opposite effect of, or, or you could get the, to the exact opposite uh, type of channel here. So the interesting thing is that, um, so this implies a, a negative coefficient on your expected uh, rates premium in your regressions, and that's exactly uh, what you get in, uh, in a lot of the uh, regressions that you are uh, showing. But you're not giving it a lot of attention in the paper at the moment. While I think it, this, is, this is really important, because if you take your mechanism seriously, it should also be at work for these ex this expectations component. And secondly, if, if the big question that you're after is really about how the slope of the yield curve predicts economic growth, it's very important to say something about the relative importance of the impact of this term premium and the impact of this expectation components due to your, uh, due to your channel. So that's, I think, really something important to think about for the paper. Um, why is this uh, expected uh, rate, uh, rates component, why does it have a negative impact? And why is it less important for bank loan granting? Because that's the impression that one gets currently when, uh, when reading the paper. Now, a last point on the relation between the term premium and credit growth. So I think your regressions are very convincing in showing this positive relation between both. At the same time, if you look at, say, aggregate more long-term uh, time series data, so this shows the, the, the five-year term premium that you're using between early 70s and, and today, and uh, the uh, credit growth in the 12 months after uh, for, the, for the US, then indeed you see this very sh uh, strong positive uh, relation in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. But later on in the sample, this, this uh, breaks down during some uh, periods. And I think this is a very uh, interesting observation and, and could give you a bit of interest, could give you interesting information about what you're really capturing with your, uh, with your mechanism. So, so one explanation there is that, of course, there might be different drivers over time of the term uh, premium. And some of these drivers might be more directly correlated with credit growth than, uh, than others. You gave the example of QE already during, uh, during your talk. QE will reduce the term premium and might activate your channel, but at the same time, there might also be the stealth recapitalization that has an impact on credit supply. Now, what I'm trying to get at here is that the importance of your channel in the end will depend on what drives the term premium and how correlated the driver is with future uh, growth. And I fully understand that with your IV setup you try, or the other identification setups, you try to tease out, say, the, the pure term premium effect. And this is very interesting because it can tell you something about the causality of, of your term premium. But at the same time, it doesn't necessarily, it, it's not necessarily informative about the relative importance of this channel. So put differently, what fraction of the correlation between the slope and, and, long -term and, and growth in a couple of months is really driven by, by your mechanism? And what's driven by um, the type of spurious correlation that people typically think about? I think that, that's an important thing to think about for the paper and to, to say something about how important this mechanism that you're capturing can potentially, uh, can potentially be.
Okay, then, and you already alluded to this in, uh, in your talk, uh, this IV setup. There's a number of things that I'd like to say about, about that as well. So the problem at hand is that, okay, obviously if you're interested in the causal impact of the Sturm premium, I mean, you're very much aware that this could be driven by factors that simultaneously correlate with loan and GDP growth. And you have uh, multiple exercises that try to fix this, one of them being this IV uh, setup. And I think this IV setup is, is in a way the least convincing uh, one here. So you're gonna use foreign official holdings as, as an instrument variable and as with every IV setup, there's uh, basically two assumptions that need to be satisfied. You need a strong correlation between the term premium and foreign official holdings, which um, you show kind of convincing me in the paper, although I, do, although I do think that also here, this might be this time variation in this relationship, which might make this IV um, more, a better one during certain periods compared to others. But okay, that's just a minor concern. The larger concern is about the exclusion restriction here. Like, as you said, in principle, if it's, if it's a good IV, it should be un uncorrelated with uh, US economic conditions. And that, I think, is a lot more, uh, a lot more question questionable because you could come up with a, a number of examples that might uh, violate this, uh, this assumption. For example, there's evidence out there that there's a strong correlation between official holdings of US debt and uh, trade between the, country, the, the third country and the US. So any economic shock or large economic shock that's happening in the US will most likely have an impact, a strong impact on this trade partner as well will affect its, uh, its, its dollar reserve, its dollar holdings, and hence its, its foreign US debt holdings, because that's one of the places where it's going to be investing this, these, uh, these dollars. So that already might um, kind of be problematic for the instrument. And in a very similar way, you could come up with a number of uh, additional examples. For example, a weakening US growth outlook leading to a dollar depreciation, which then could lead to um, foreign exchange interventions by uh, central banks of a third country to uh, prevent their currency appreciating against the dollar. Um, I think a, a well-known example is Japan in, in the early 2000s. And this again would um, automatically lead to a link between economic conditions in the US and, and this instrument. So, I mean, long story short, I very much prefer the uh, term premium shock approach that you use in, in the other part of the paper um, compared, to this, uh, co compared to this IV setup. I think that's uh, a lot more convincing, and that's that's really the uh, a lot more convincing in, in bringing the mes message that you that you want to bring. I think so. Apart from that, I, the only other comments I have are, are really uh, more minor compared uh, to these. I mean, maybe I only uh, pick out uh, the very last ones. Like in the end, if you want to say something about the slope of the yield curve and, and aggregate growth. What's also, it's interesting that you're doing this exercise for the US in a way, because I always think of the US as mainly being a market-based finance type of economy. So you can then question like how, how important would this type of channel be in this economy? On, on the upside, if it's already quite important here, then I mean, you're capturing a lower bound in the way potentially. So that's kind of, it would be, would be good news for, uh, for the paper from that perspective. So overall, let me, uh, conclude. So I think this is a very interesting read. So definitely worth reading. It's a very thought-provoking paper. I very much enjoyed reading it. And uh, yeah, I wish you uh, best of luck with it. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Um, do you want to respond before we open the floor? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Glenn, for, for the fantastic um, comments. And this is exactly what I was hoping to get, a little bit of pushback on at least one of the identification strategies. Um, so I appreciate the comment about maybe giving more uh, attention to the expectations component of the yield curve and trying to you know, be clear about the signs we're getting, um, uh, as well as um, you know, the insight you showed on, with, with the chart on the correlation between the term premium and credit growth over a long period of time, a much stronger lagged correlation um, before, before the zero lower bound essentially than afterwards. And it's consistent with what we find in the empirical analysis that the relation we have in mind is a lot stronger historically, a little bit weaker um, at the zero lower bound, at least in the, in the bank level panel, Interestingly, as we went to the credit registry, which is entirely post, um, post GFC, we were able to find effects there as well. But um, you know, the, the valuation channel is working against us finding anything. Um, so the fact that we find anything is sort of reassuring. Like I mentioned, we did not take, um, we have not undertaken an exercise where we um, take, um, you know, the 
zero lower bound uh, constraints seriously. Like we don't bring the interest rates to zero as we calibrate the model and look at the impulse response function. So um, I, I maybe so I will leave my comments here. That's something that we, we should do to to be a little bit sharper on the interpretation of the results. Um, you also push you're pushing us to speak about the importance of the channel um, relative to to the valuation channel, and I fully agree. That's that. That's definitely something on our radar. The calibration of the model we currently have right now um, shows that our channel dominates the valuation channel. So in the particular calibration we have, it's possible that again, at, at the zero lower bound, this may be uh, reversed. The IV you found least convincing. The exclusion restriction is very difficult to um, uh, test. I think what I'm going to propose is um, maybe short of abandoning it, it, it is to uh, maybe come up with a size of the violation of the exclusion restriction that I would tolerate before you know, calling the results completely spurious. And so um, we can quantify that and, and see if that's something we can live with. Um, and finally, um, yeah, it, it, it is very, so I think it's generally a little bit misunderstood that the U.S. being a, a bond, uh, you know, a, a markets-based economy, it doesn't mean that the, the uh, bank lending channels or bank credit channels are not very powerful and potent. Um, there are a lot of privately held firms in the U.S. that are bank dependent that don't have access to the bond market. Um, just in the credit registry alone, which omits a lot of small firms and a lot of small banks, we have, um, you know, 100,000 firms of which only 2,000 are publicly held. Um, so the, the remaining firms um, uh, rely on bank debt quite a bit. And so these financial and real shocks that work their way through the, fin through the banking system tend to um, hurt them or, or help them um, significantly. Okay, thanks a lot. There's a hand up here and then one there. As, as usual, please identify yourself. Uh, Andre Kerman, Drexel University. So uh, first, it, it's really interesting uh, uh, the different empirical results that you show. I, I just want to uh, follow up a little bit on the discussion's point that about the quantitative importance. Um, mm. So first, an observation, which is that going back to Campbell and Schiller in the late 80s, um, it seems, uh, or, or there's a lot of evidence that the expectations part explains, I think, the lion's share of, of uh, slope movements now. Statistically, of course, the expectations hypothesis may be rejected, but it's, it's the main driver. And, and so I think in your graph, I, I would appreciate to see that too. You know, you put the term premium uh, movements and the mm -hmm. slope after the temper tantrum on two different scales, right? If you put them on the same scale, you would see that the term premium increases by very little relative to the, to the slope. The other point I wanted to make is that you could also think that the term premium is driven in part by growth, uh, changes in growth. So if you take, say, uh, Piazzesi Schneider's NBR macroannual paper, right, they show that in a consumption-based asset pricing model, inflation and consumption growth, the covariance is a potentially yeah. important driver of term structure. So if, if that growth change has an effect on the term premium, that could be even affecting in reverse causality, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't take away from your results, but I think it's really important to, to document the quantitative importance. But yeah, thank you. Great paper. That, that's a great comment. Um, so it's true. So in our model, we are somewhat modest. We don't try to pin down the term premium endogenously, uh, along with the bank's lending decision or, or asset allocation decision. Uh, we take it as it's a partial equilibrium. We take it as um, so we don't pin endo down endogenously the term premium and interest rates. We take them as exogenous and simply examine banks' uh, responses to fluctuations, um, exogenous fluctuations in the term premium and in and interest rates. Um, as for the expectations, explaining the lion's share, absolutely right. I think there are some estimates from the board recently uh, um, suggesting that about two thirds of the variations in the yield curve are explaining, explained by expectations. So yes, I think it's important for us to um, think more about the quantitative importance of the channel and, and sort of relate it to um, you know, um, this other channel, the expectation channel that could be quantitatively more important. Absolutely. Very interesting, uh, Alp Simsek, Yale. Uh, very interesting and thought-provoking paper. I find it goes quite a bit against conventional wisdom. Because we usually think high-term premium as uh, monetary tightening, right? High-term premium, higher rates for borrowers, mm 
less borrowing, less investment. Mm -hmm. In fact, the basic idea of QE is uh, compress term premium and stimulate the economy. And conversely, the, the main concern around taper tantrum was that at the Fed was that it might lead to an over tightening of policy. And that's why Ben Bernanke went around and tried to convince the markets that they misunderstood him, et cetera. So, so, are you, so you, you, I think you're identifying a mechanism that might dampen this conventional wisdom. But are you saying that actually conventional wisdom is wrong and this is the main mechanism we should think about, even leaving aside valuation effects? We should think of term premium as like stimulating or is it just a dampener? I'd like to clarify that. Thank you. So for it to be a dampener, it means that we have another channel in mind that is the main channel, and then this is one on top of it that dampens the effect of that main channel. Um, I, I think that um, you know we should give it, we should give this expected profitability channel uh, equal power as we do to the valuation channel through which QE, uh, lowering of the term premium works. Like both of them, I think, are valid channel by which, channels by which uh, banks will react to changes in the term premium. I don't see one as a dampener of the other. We can definitely put them in a horse race and see at least empirically which one dominates. We can write up a model where one dominates, we calibrate the model in, in, and depending on um, the calibration, one may dominate the other. So I would see them as competing channel, if you will, or coexisting rather, coexisting channels. Um, but I think that the channel that we identify is definitely one in its own right. Yeah. So there's one last question from Christian. Thanks. Um, Christian Kubica, ECB. Uh, hi, Camilla, great presentation. Um, I have a question about the uh, identifying assumption in your not IV setup but the loan registry set up. Mm -hmm. um, so you do a, a convincing job uh, using the standard methodology of firm by time fixed effects to shut down um, loan demand channel. Mm. Then I guess the, the main worry that remains is that you have some omitted variable, let's say great growth expectations, they drive up term premium, they drive up loan supply. So um, then you argue, okay, um, you use heterogeneity across banks in their capital constraint or leverage constraint, arguing that more constrained banks should react more. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I would argue that any omitted variable, for example, great growth expectations, should also affect more financially constrained banks more. So um, for, for all the omitted variables that I'd, be, I'd, I'd see as concerning, they should also go in the same direction, namely implying a stronger correlation between more constrained banks and the term premium relative mm -hmm. to less constrained banks. So I was wondering how you think about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so. I think the regressions will be believable. The regression results will be believable as long as you believe that we measure as well as possible the bank level growth expectations. They enter not only in, level, in levels and interacted with the post, so we allow them to change after the taper tantrum, but we also interact them with every single right-hand side variable in terms of bank characteristics. So we interact them with leverage as well. So there is a powerful horse race there for our diff in diff term. Um, we allow for con confounders for leverage as well as for confounders for the post dummy capturing the rise in the term premium. And in particular, you know, one of the terms that we put in this horse race is um, uh, leverage times expectations, bank level expectations. So. There's not more that we can do other than saturate this specification and you know, um, sort of try to strengthen it as much as we can this way, as well as providing additional um, evidence from other uh, time periods, from other data sets, from other uh, identification strategies. I would see overall the evidence as supporting our story, but I will also very much agree um, that there's no perfect identification strategy. Okay. So thank you very much to both the presenter and, and discussant for very nice. Thank you. And then I would ask Moritz and Giorgio to come on the podium. Okay, so I, I, I promise you we're going to do a time travel yeah. now going back yeah. to the 1500s. Uh, Moritz will do this for us. Uh, Moritz is from the Keele Institute for the World Economy, and he has a paper on central bank balance sheets and financial crisis. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, um, that's working great. Um, well, thanks uh, to the organizers for having me. It's a great pleasure to be back and see so many 
I want to say friends and family almost, um, in the audience. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I am going to be that uh, guy uh, who jointly with Neil, Martin and Paul is going to take you on the journey uh, into the history of central bank balance sheets uh, in, the next, in the next few minutes. Um, and uh, we are not shy to answer one very big question on which there is uh, exceptionally little research, at least on the empirical side, namely uh, we're interested in the effect of central bank uh, crisis interventions, lender of last resort operations that we have seen um, quite frequently, unfortunately, I guess we want to say in recent years, um, by all uh, major central banks. And uh, the debate on the positive effects of such interventions, you know, cutting short run equilibria, stabilizing the financial sector, um, uh, uh, sort of intervening in, in potential fire sale situations, are often contrasted uh, with the potentially negative side effects, namely the moral hazard, the uh, fact that it sometimes feels that central banks have to run faster just to stand still in every crisis. And uh, so we, 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 as I said, we're not shy. We, we're going to lever the history of central bank balance sheets in the modern period, going back indeed to the 1600s, to study the causal effects. And I, I'm sure we're going to discuss that causal statement here um, during financial crisis on macroeconomic outcomes. More precisely, what we're going to do is gonna be, we have this new novel, uh, new data set for central bank balance sheets and their composition for 17 economies since um, uh, the early years. Um, we're going to use that data to study long-run evolution of balance sheets. When we clean up, I give you some stylized facts that uh, uh, you might think uh, are interesting, and uh, then we'll zoom in on the on, on the on balance sheet expansions. And importantly, we're going to show and argue that uh, throughout the history of central banking, there have always been sort of distinct schools when thinking about lending or uh, lender of last resort operations. So in the, in the 19th century, there was the famous hanky badger debate for those of you who study sort of history of economic thought, opposing those who said like central banks should not get their hands dirty and you know, let f purge the financial system that's in trouble. Um, there were the liquidationists in, in, the, in the early 20th century uh, into, the, into the interwar period. You know, the, you know the famous Mellon statement that you know, let the banks go under, let's purge the rottenness out of the system system, public sector shouldn't get involved in, in saving these speculators. Um, and, um, you know, until recently, there is a tradition of, um, you know, not far from here, maybe of sort of monetarist uh, people who are very skeptical of, um, generally speaking, um, um, doing things that uh, could be interpreted as being discretionary rule deviation in crisis. So we're going to use this history of economic thought, we're going to use the intellectual predispositions of governors in charge um, and correlate them with the probability of providing support in crisis times. I'm going to argue that these, um, sort of the, the, the governor in charge and, and typically his um, 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 intellectual or ideological predisposition to giving support to in, using the central bank balance sheet in crisis times is, um, is, is exogenous, and we're going to use that to estimate the causal effects of these interventions. Now, I'm going to convince you, I hope, that this does make sense. So we have the near universe of modern era financial crises, and um, and we're going to code for each governor in charge, uh, the school, the ex-ante sort of belief system that he had. and. We'll ask in the first stage, does this actually correlate with the probability of the central bank using or taking on that lender of last resort role, expanding the balance sheet? We say, yes, that does, and then we're going to causally estimate that. Okay, so there's a big literature on <clears throat> central bank balance sheet and the effects of LLR, but if, I think, I mean, actually, maybe I need to take that back. It's not that big. There is, there's not that much that we have on the empirical side, maybe the some of you know the, uh, the Honor and Klingerbeel paper, uh, Mike Bordeaux and co-authors have done something, but it's not overly big, and I don't think there is a, there is a, um, a paper, I mean, maybe, maybe the, or just discuss, and maybe, maybe you found something, but I, I'm not aware of that. There's definitely a large literature on financial crisis and their effect, and um, recently, Ulrich Marmandier and others have used that idea of central gov bank governor believes as an instrument um, uh, for uh, uh, to test economic outcomes, making the argument that these are sort of predisposed, these are predetermined um, and, and largely exogenous to the situation that the governors then find themselves in. Okay, so the agenda, the evolution of central bank balance sheet, then we'll zoom in on balance sheet expansions, 
and then the main part is really going to be that study of the causal effects of, um, of LLR interventions. Okay, so this is um, the stylized fact part. We stylized facts part. We have annual central bank balance sheet data for 17 countries, covering the size and detail composition starting from the 1600s. We're going to have macroeconomic data and crisis chronologies from uh, BVX, which is Baron Werner Young and JST George Fulick Taylor data bit sets. Uh, we're going to make the data available as usual, and, and, and uh, there's historical sources that we use to classify the ex ante ideological predisposition of, in total, 112 central bank governors prior to financial crisis. Uh, this is the data set. You just get the countries. It's the usual kind of Western focused or um, 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 data set for which we have long run data. Um, this is the evolution of central bank total assets over GDP in these 17 countries. Um, this is a chart that you probably have seen in one or the other version, not going back quite as far, but you've, you've maybe seen it for the, for the 20th century, showing this massive spike, obviously, in, in the size of balance sheets relative to GDP across the, um, across the OECD world, I should say, or, or the, the, the industrial uh, uh, world plus, plus Japan and, and uh, a few others. One of the interesting um, facts that comes out of our work is if you scale this not by GDP, but by the size of the financial sector, if you think about the financial stability role of central banks, maybe that is for some questions the appropriate scaling, things look very different. By this scale, the central bank balance sheet are actually quite small relative to what's out there now in terms of you know, financial assets, borrowing and lending. It's gone up a little bit, but we are, you know, <coughs> in that perspective. Water, sorry. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Um, we are in relatively safe. Uh, well, it looks like not safe is a, is a too strong statement, but we are in a in a, in a less um, extraordinary time. Um, same actually happens if you scale central bank holding of government debt relative to GDP. Again, it looks um, quite unprecedented that we're almost at uh, times that typically were, or at levels that were typically reser reserved for, for war times. And, um, and we're, you know, at least in the major economies in peace right now. But again, if you scale this by the share of government debt, debt outstanding, things look a little bit more benign. And what's ha of course, it has happened that overall financial debt relative to GDP has increased substantially. And that government debt relative to GDP has gone up quite a lot. So the scaling really matters for um, how you want to think about the size of central bank balance sheet in this moment. And some might say this is, you know, if you focus on the financial stability role versus the stabilization role, you come to quite different conclusions. Okay. Major balance sheet expansions and their drivers, sorry. So what you see here are expansions by event type. And expansions are defined as 15% nominal year-on-year -year asset growth. We could do this with 20% or 30%. It, this, it, it wouldn't change the basic message of this chart, which is balance sheet expansions over time have shifted from, I don't know what we code wars in green. It looks far too friendly. Um, from war times, from government finance in, types, in terms of emergency, to what you see out here is the red, um, and then there's some natural disaster as well, is, tip, is, is mainly a financial crisis intervention type. So when we see, when we observe balance sheet expansions in, the, in, this, uh, in this sample in the 20th century, you see this shift from um, interventions in, in war times, typically government finance, operations, you see this here in the two world wars as well, two financial crisis interventions. And you can do this a little bit more formally and just estimate the central bank's sensitivity to crisis events over time. So this is pre-industrialization, industrialization period, the first globalization, the world war period, and post-world war II. And you see that in financial crisis, typically pre, um, in, in, in the early times, there were some interventions, but it's not clear that um, central banks actually um, uh, intervened almost in, intervened um, um, as a sort of as a rule. But now you could always say that we are in a world where central bank interventions in financial crisis have almost become, or central bank ex balance sheet expansions, I should say, during crisis times have um, almost become systematic. They are expected 
um, certainly also, I mean, it's at least the probability uh, is very high, 60%, so there's some chance that market participants will price that in as well. Okay, so these are interventions. Now let's talk about in the last 15 minutes about the main idea and the main, I think, um, if you will, the main, um, find, uh, the main new contribution here of this paper. Namely, what do we do to um, test and estimate the causal effects of central bank liquidity support in crisis times? So to start with, um, we're going to define lender, the lender of last resort a role as central bank lending to banks that are unable to borrow at viable rates from distressed markets. Um, we're going to operationalize that in a very crude way, and, and maybe we can do better here, uh, if we had more detailed balance sheet data, I should say, as an annual central bank balance sheet growth of 15% around the crisis time. Yeah? Um, we're going to have um, central bank land of last resort operations that increase bank reserves by, via balance sheet expansion, so that we use that definition, and we uh, bring that together with a full set of crisis dates from uh, BVX, Baron Werner's Young, and, and, and JST. Um, if you just track as an event study, um, and this is similar to what, what Mike Bordo and, and others have done before, the, um, the evolution of real GDP and the, the trajectory of real GDP in crises with and without liquidity intervention, so zero here is the year of the crisis, and you see how G real GDP evolves into the crisis and then after the crisis, you would come to the somewhat paradoxical conclusion, and some of these papers make that point, and if you will, that's kind of the, the, where the literature stands, that it's not clear that these central bank interventions from this very high flying altitude macro perspective have a positive effect. If anything, you'd say like, oh, the average trajectory without liquidity injections is actually better than the one with liquidity injections. But obviously, there is a large endogeneity or real causality problem, whereas crises might simply warrant more support. So we need, uh, we need to do better than this. And this is what we propose to to do. We, obviously, we need, what we need is quasi-random variation in liquidity support during crisis, and um, that's not easy to come by, but we think we can exploit these long-standing differences and opposing schools of thought on the pros and cons of discretionary central bank interventions in crisis times. So in the 19th century, I mentioned the hanky budget debate. Um, in, the, in the late 19th, early 20th century, there's the whole, the whole debate about the real bills doctrine and liquidationists, so the idea that central banks would only take real sector collateral and not financial sector collateral, and the real bills guys were consequently opposed to um, lender of last resort operations just vis-a-vis um, -vis banks. And then there's the rules-focused monetarist, you know, this is sort of the brunner meltzer tradition that, you know, um, kind of lives on in, in various forms over time. Um, so, we argue that governors that were ex-anti-influenced or sympathetic to these schools could be less likely to intervene. So, to the liquidationist school, the real bill school, the hanky school, as, uh, as opposed to Badgett. And we're going to use that as an instrumental variable, namely the beliefs of uh, central bank governors regarding the LLR benefits. Um, here's an example. There is Richard Koch, Richard Koch. He was governor of the Reichsbank in the early, nine, uh, early 20th century. And he was an intellectual tradition of the liquidationist. He was, a, as the Burson Zeitung called him, a fierce defender of non-intervention. So comes the 1907 crisis. Uh, Koch refuses to intervene, despite a lot of pressure to do so. He, uh, and then there's a quote, he was intent on cleansing the Reichsbank balance sheet of all non-trade bills. We refuse to let the Reichsbank be a cheap source of liquidity for commerce, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this is, this, this is the arc of intellectual history that we, we, we're going to use. Um, the hankiest, these are the, the, the real bills tradition, the liquidationist, the Mellon school. Some of these, you know, they overlap. But there is, at each point, I found this quite interesting, actually. At each point in time, there is this debate. Right, to, right today, where you, would all be, you open the Financial Times at any given moment, and there would be, you know, with some likelihood in any given week, someone warning of the more hazard effects of too much central bank uh, support and someone saying like, well, no, no, this is necessary. We can't hold Main Street hostage for what's going on on Wall Street. So this is a really like a long-standing um, long sort of intellectual fight out there that we think we can lever. And you see here some of these examples, which we, the monetarist here, the Bruno Meltzer Taylor School, as we call them. So you, at each given moment, you find people who's like, no, this is not, we should be more cautious here. So how do we do this? We, um, we code central bank governor beliefs before 
the crisis. That's important. So we use material, we use sources, we newspapers, dictionary, um, I'm sorry, sort of national uh, biographies. Here the example is the Gallica from the, the, the BNF. Um, before the crisis date and look through them and look at statements that would identify sort of the intellectual home of these governments. Um, Here's the, the Koch example again. We pay particular attention to statements revealing moral hazard concerns. So President Koch is the fierce defender of the gold standard, loathed by the bimetallist, cleanses the, right, cleanses the rice bank's balance sheet. And this is, this, these are statements from 1903, so you know, well before the 1907 crisis. And we say we can sort of classify him here as a, as a hawk. Um, then we come up with this whole panorama of hawks and doves or pragmatists. So doves and pragmatists, when we're not sure, we, we, we kind of, what we really can do is identify the hawks, and then we just put the doves and pragmatists in one camp. So Ben Bernanke, we call him like a pragmatist. He's not a hawk, and, but then there's some Mervyn King, you know, he, many of us in the room know him, we call him a hawk because he's been, um, until at some point in the crisis, quite outspoken about the moral hazard concerns and uh, wasn't uh, super happy to Intervene. You might disagree with some of those. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet is a pragmatist. You know, we, we'll, we can disagree with some of these um, 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 classifications, but we do them uh, for all uh, crises that we have in the data set. So first, uh, very simple um, um, look at the data. Hawks and doves, what's the prob probability of hawkish or dovish governors use expanding the balance sheet by 15% or more in each of the years following a crisis. And you see there's a difference. The blue guys are the, uh, the doves. They're much more likely. Um, and that probability rises as we, as we go along. Um, and first look maybe at the, at the crisis outcomes as well. Here now we classify, maybe look in the middle at log real GDP. So that's similar to what I showed you before. This is the average, the blue one is the average trajectory under dovish governors, and then the average trajectory under hawkish governors, and you see this uh, slight difference, both in GDP and in, in CPI, et cetera. You don't see it so much on the, on the monetary side, and I'll come to that in a second. Okay, so this is not very formal yet. Let's get a little bit more formal. So the first stage, the probability, is we're gonna estimate the probability of seeing a balance sheet expansion in the crisis, defined as an annual balance sheet growth of 15% in the year of the crisis or in the year between crisis and T plus one. And um, if we sort of parse this, classify this by doves and hawks, we get, for the doves, we have about 22 crises without intervention and 21 crises with intervention. For the hawks, you see there's a big difference in the mean. The hawks have, uh, there's 26 crises without intervention and then in nine of those crises, the hawks also intervene. So we have some nice um, variation here that we can play with. You also get a sense for, one of the big problems, I guess, that macro has, which is like even if you look at the universe of modern era crises, you end up with 90 or so and over a few hundred years. So if that's your level of observation, the individual crises or even the business cycle, we still don't have that much data to work with. Okay, so we're going to estimate the first stage, which is um, the um, balance sheet expansion. There's going to be this variable here if you're hawkish governor or not, and then there's going to hold a whole set of macro financial control variables. And then on the second stage, we're going to use that as an, as an instrument for the, um, for the effect of the balance sheet intervention. And this YIT here, that it's going to be a local projection of the effects on GDP and then other outcome variables um, after, the, after the intervention. We have country fixed effects. We have um, the, the usual control variables that I'm going to show you here. There's going to be inflation. There's going to be money. There's going to be GP, GP per capita. The things you want to go, we want to see. There is, we're going to control for the three-year growth of real private sector bank lending. So we want to control for the size of the credit boom that might correlate with the severity of the crisis, etc. In the end, we would still argue that the, the big assumption you need to make is that the sort of the hawk duff. Um, Allocation to the crisis, if you will, is, is, is quasi-random and has nothing to do with, the, with, the, um, with that severity ex ante. So here's the first stage. Hawkish governors are about 40% less likely to intervene or to expand the balance sheet in the crisis to provide liquidity to the financial sector to take on that lend of last resort role. Um, all else equal. No? All the, with country fixed effects, with macro controls, there is a clear difference. You have a hawk in charge. Um, and there's an assumption, obviously, that the governor kind of is very important to, for the decision making of the, of the central bank overall, but we see that in the data. And then in the second stage, we're going to track the path of real GDP, of CPI, and of uh, money over horizons going forward. 
Um, in, and, and we're going to estimate the impact of central bank liquidity interjection with confidence bands comparing the path with intervention to a, then what we think is a plausible counterfactual without liquidity interjection. And uh, what we end up with uh, is good news for central banks. And it's also good news for, for people who believe this is, essentially, this is financial stability, this budget, land of last resort role is important and beneficial overall uh, because we find if you buy into our identification, we find large effects. Uh, if you look at the real economy here, uh, large differences in the trajectories with and without liquidity in, in injection. Essentially, um, being a dove, um, supporting, you know, in, sort of in, this, in this setup, being more or less randomly allocated to the crisis, being a dove, expanding, supporting the financial sector early, gives you um, a better GDP outcome, it gives you better um, price outcome and it gives you more money growth and it's part of implicit in the in the balance sheet expansion so you all in all you end up with a with a stabilization package that um, that looks quite it looks much better than than what you get in the sort of um, in the in the hawkish case um, look at investment in stock prices um, also something that I think some of us will um, will have in mind from previous crises <coughs> that um, in the average trajectory without liquidity provision is much worse. It takes much longer for investment to recover. The stock prices are much more uh, depressed for a longer period where the interventions push them up. And I think a lot of that sort of rhymes with, with you know, what we've seen in, 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 in crises in the, in, the, in the past few years. So is this about really land of last resort operation or is this about something else? Is this about the central bank monetizing um, the, the, the deficit and this is about fiscal stabilization th through the back door? See here, um, what about what happens to um, central bank government, government assets in, over the crisis between uh, hawks and doves? There's barely a difference. So this is not about um, sort of you know a, a, a intervention to uh, support um, you know by, by buying up government debt, supporting uh, fiscal operations. This is really driven by difference in uh, the uh, increase in central bank reserves. So operations with the financial sector. Um, we also find, uh, if anything, that under Hawks, government expenditure after crisis increases more, potentially because there is more need for that to stabilize the economy. And also government debt increases more uh, in Hawkish, under Hawkish governors uh, in crisis than under, um, than under, than under Doves. Again, this controls for uh, all kinds of macro um, financial variables. A bunch of robustness checks, and we're not going to talk about those. They're all in the paper. I want to use my last uh, minute or two um, to bring across one additional, you know, element that um, gives a little bit of a um, little bit of sort of hope for the Hawks. Namely, we are looking for evidence that more hazard could, after all, sort of come back to haunt you, um, and. Uh, so what we look at here is um, the, um, the, the share of country years in which countries that after a, after a, uh, um, a, a crisis with a liquidity in injection compared to a crisis without a liquidity injection um, experience another bad credit boom. That's you know, arguably sort of a little bit of a rough criterion, but you can see here a difference that if you, as a country, as an economy, come out of a crisis and you had a hawk in charge and the financial sector, you know, you had worse economic outcomes, your financial sector potentially learned the lesson, I don't know, but um, you get the share of bad booms happening in the next 15 to 20 years is much lower, whereas, you know, there's some evidence, and I'll give you some regressions in a second, that seems to suggest that intervening in the short term comes potentially at the cost of you know, the next bad boom, the next crisis, the next bad boom, epi boom bust episode being more likely. Again, I'm, 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 you know, intentionally, I'm, I'm intentionally sort of cautious on making strong statements because obviously here we're all kind of all kinds of um, identification issues that uh, should not distract from what I think is quite nice identification for the, in the previous part. But here are, the, here are some of these. Uh, um, um, a regression. So, the liquidity interjection, the last crisis, predicts with some, you know, with some um, statistical uh, significance, the likelihood of getting into next in the boom bust episode uh, within the next um, within the next 20 years. Okay, that's it. Conclusion: um, Central bank balance sheets have grown a lot relative to 
real economy size, but not relative to financial sector size. So I think that's something we want to keep in mind when we think about um, the, the future of central bank balance sheet. Um, large liquidity injections stabilize the economy, financial markets in, in crisis times and boost the recovery. So there is evidence that being a lend, being, assuming that lend of last resort a function is, 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 is valuable and maybe, maybe there's some more hazard concern. Thank you very much. Moritz, the discussion is Giorgio Primigeri from Northwestern University. You have 15 minutes. All right, so thank you very much for the invitation. This is a nice and important paper. It involves an impressive amount of work, as you probably might have noticed from Moritz's presentation, and it's very dense uh, when it comes to results and facts. Uh, and so the first thing that I'm gonna do, I'm going to summarize the paper in a single slide. Uh, so that's a little bit of a heroic task, uh, or at least my reading of the important results in the paper. So the paper is a very well-defined goal, which is to study the effect of central bank liquidity support during financial crisis. Uh, the question, obviously, is an old one. It's not, a no, it's not a new one, but the approach is rather new because instead of focusing on a single episode, for example, the great financial crisis in the US, uh, or on the history of a single country, the paper uh, constructs a novel data set that covers 17 advanced economies uh, since 1580-something. Uh, okay? So a very long data set. Uh, and the first contribution of the paper, well, the first contribution of the paper is the data set itself. But then, only based on this data set, the authors can construct uh, a host of interesting stylized facts. Uh, here are a couple of them that we saw in Moritz's presentation. The fact that the size of uh, the central bank balance sheet relative to GDP has skyrocketed over the last 20 years. But the situation is very different if we focus instead on the size of the central bank balance sheet relative to lending to private firms. And so this, of course, uh, a corollary of this means that lending to private firms has exploded in the last few years, something to, uh, to keep in mind. But the others are very ambitious, so they don't want to stop at collecting or documenting stylized facts. They really want to get at the causal effect of intervening for a central bank during a crisis on macro outcomes. And this is a difficult task because uh, uh, central bank interventions are endogenous to political and economic circumstances. Whether central bank intervenes, how much it intervenes depends on the state of the economy. So you cannot simply run a regression of macro outcomes during a crisis on whether or not a central bank has intervened or the extent of the intervention. So they need an instrument, and their clever idea is to use as a, an instrument in their IV strategy the beliefs of the appointed central banker, the belief before the crisis. Okay? And this is an analysis that they conduct on a shorter sample. Now, based on this instrumental variable strategy, well, they, they document two important results. The first one is that central bank balance sheet expansion of at least 15% during or right after a financial crisis bolsters real GDP by about 21% over the subsequent three years. This is a very large amount. Okay? And the second, this is about short-term gains of policy intervention. But they also have a result about possible long-term risks of policy intervention. So this is the graph that, uh, um, you know, I said one slide and two figures. I'll show you the first figure. This is the second figure, which I will use later on for a little exercise. This shows the difference between uh, log real GDP in countries in which the central bank intervenes during a financial crisis and countries where the central bank does not intervene. But the second result is about long-term negative consequences of uh, uh, central bank liquidity support. And they show that central bank liquidity support in the current crisis makes the next crisis more likely. This is exactly what we probably would expect, right? This moral hazard concern is uh, it implies this, um, 
So um, if I were a monetary historian, I could spend all of my remaining 10 minutes and probably more on the construction of the data set, arguing about specific choices. There are many, many choices that the authors had to make in order to construct the data set, to process the data. Um, there is an 87 append page appendix <laughs> that goes uh, into these painful details. But I'm not a monetary historian, so I decided to trust the authors entirely uh, about their choices, <laughs> or some of their choices, and instead I will organize my comments around these two points. I want to discuss possible threats to identification. Um, I will try to argue that the beliefs of the appointed central bank, even before the crisis, are to some extent endogenous to the to economic circumstances. And so this is going to serve as a note of caution about the causal interpretation of some of these results. And the second part of the comments instead, I will do a heroic exercise, a very back of the envelope calculation, because I want to try to put the um, short term gains of the central bank intervention on the same scale as, as these uh, long term risks to see whether they are of comparable magnitude or whether maybe the short-term gains are just clearly superior to any long-term risk that it's obvious that uh, central banks should intervene or maybe things are uh, less clear-cut. And I will conclude that they're less clear-cut. Uh, okay, so let's start with the possible uh, threats to identification. I want to discuss basically whether the instrument that they use is really exogenous. Remember that the instrument uh, used are the pre-crisis beliefs of the appointed central bank, of the central banker in charge at that point. And for the, for the instrument to be exogenous, we need to believe that these views, these beliefs of central banks should correlate with a macro outcome during a crisis only through the effect of beliefs on whether a central bank uh, decides to provide liquidity support or not. And there are reasons to be, to be skeptical. Uh, this is a little bit of an extreme assumption. Uh, the paper is very open about one possible limitation, one possible threat to identification. In fact, I'm quoting uh, the paper. And the, the argument here is very simple. If there is a dovish central banker in charge, or if the market anticipates that there will be, in the future, a dovish central banker in charge, um, then this anticipation of a dovish crisis management might encourage financial risk taking and make the next crisis more likely. Of course, if this is true, if this is an important consideration, this will lead to an understatement of the effect of central bank liquidity support in the sense that the effect of central bank liquidity support in reality will be even bigger, larger than what uh, Moritz and co-authors estimate. So let me try to argue that there are other reasons uh, to be uh, a little bit concerned, and these other reasons might actually lead to overestimating the effect of central bank liquidity intervention. And the idea that I would like to uh, discuss is that excessive risk taking today might actually lead to the appointment of a hawkish central banker. Maybe the people in charge or the markets realize that there is excessive risk taking and there is the need of a central banker that tightens financial regulation. Now, if excessive risk taking today lead both to a more likely appointment of a hawkish central bank and a more likely crisis tomorrow, you might actually uh, overstate the effect of central bank liquidity support, okay? Now, is this just a theoretical curiosity, or is it what happens in reality? The truth is that I don't know, <laughs> and uh, especially I, I have no idea uh, how to think about the 1600 and the 1700. But I do know that uh, for type of historical episodes that I've looked at, like for example the, the, the great inflation in the United States, uh, the fact that inflation had been high at the end of the 1970s for at least 10 years at that point led to the appointment of Paul Volcker as a central banker. Paul Volcker had a reputation of being a hawkish central banker, a reputation of being a central banker that would have likely fought inflation, 
And in fact, he was appointed uh, uh, central banker. So this endogeneity of the appointments of central bankers, I think, could be uh, a concern. So again, I'm not en entirely sure how important concern number one or concern number two are in practice. This is just a note of caution about interpreting, um, you know, literally, causally, uh, some, of those, uh, some of those estimates. Let me go to the second set of comments, which is about comparing long-term gains, uh, sorry, short-term gains with uh, long-term risks. Remember that the paper estimates that central bank liquidity support today in the current crisis reduces the severity, reduces the recession in the current crisis, but makes the next crisis more likely. And so can we compare these two things? So when we look uh, at a time span of about, say, 20 or 25 years, who's better off? The country in which the central bank intervenes today or the country in which the central bank decides not to intervene? Of course, this depends on parameter values. For example, one key parameter is how severe the next crisis is going to be. Okay? And let me show you some uh, uh, possible. So I'm, my little simulation exercise, which is loosely based on some of the results of the paper, involves the simulation of many possible GDP paths. Okay? Let me show you four possible cases. So um, this is a simulation that starts with a crisis. Okay, all of these simulations start with a crisis today that lasts five years. That's a typical uh, scenario. And the red country is a country with a central bank that intervenes with liquidity support today, while the blue country is a country with a central bank that decides not to intervene. Based on the results in the paper, there is a discrepancy in real GDP today, depending on whether the bank intervenes or not. The country in which the bank intervenes is better off. In this particular simulation, I constructed it by assuming that there are no more crises in the future. And I also assume that whatever distance there is in GDP red and GDP blue, this persists forever. Now, another possible, so this is the initial crisis, and the central bank liquidity support reduces the recession. Another possible simulation is a simulation in which there is a crisis today, and then the country in which the central bank decides not to intervene is subject to another crisis after 15 years, while the country where the central bank intervenes has no more crisis within 20 years. That's another possible. These are going to be stochastic simulations, so these are examples of possible paths. Case number three is the opposite. There is the crisis today, and the country in which the central bank decided to intervene is actually subject to a crisis after 10 years again. Now, the paper's estimates suggest that this is more likely than the upper row. And this is uh, one last case in which there are subsequent crises in both countries but the crisis in the country with intervention happens earlier, okay? So again, the results in the paper suggest that the bottom row is more likely than the upper row. All right, so I'm gonna do this many, many times. Having this crisis happening stochastically and calibrating the exercise on some of the results of the paper. For example, I'm gonna calibrate the GDP difference in the current crisis between countries with an intervention in central bank and a non-intervention in central bank based on this. This is what the paper estimates. Uh, so I'm gonna use this number. I'm gonna assume that this is a distance of five, this is a distance of 8%, this is a distance of 7%. Then I'm going to calibrate the probability that the subsequent crisis within 20 years happens in the country that has decided not to intervene today, I'm going to calibrate to 4% per year based on this graph, where the average probability is 4%. Then I'm going to pro uh, calibrate the probability of a subsequent crisis uh, happening in a country where the central bank instead decided to intervene today to 14%. Don't take these numbers too seriously, in the sense that this, in, 
take his numbers seriously, but my interpretation and my use of those numbers into the context of this simple exercise, not too seriously. So I, I, I took this 14% from this table that basically estimates that the increase in the probability of the next crisis for a country whose central bank decides to intervene today is approximately is between 4 and 16% more than in the country that does not intervene. So I collapse this to 10% and I use 14. And finally, this is the key parameter here that determines everything. How costly is going to be the next crisis? Um, I'm almost done, Michael, one minute. And I'm going to analyze two cases, one with a milder crisis. I don't know how mild, maybe this is already fairly severe, which is a crisis of 5% losses in GDP per year for five years. And the next one is instead, ten, this is a severe crisis, 10%. And I'm going to assume that when the crisis happens again, both countries react the same. Okay? I don't want to introduce that additional dim <coughs> dimension uh, uh, that, that additional difference. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate many possible GDP paths, and then I'm going to average GDP over 25 years in these two type of countries, the countries that initially reacted and the countries that initially didn't. And this is the, this, the blue here is the distribution of average GDP in countries that decided to react in the early crisis. And it's normal, the mean is normalized to be one. Here you can see that countries that decided not to react initially, they're most likely worse off. Okay? So there's only a limited probability that these are better off. And this is in the case of a fairly mild crisis. If instead the subsequent crisis is more severe, Given that the country that intervened today is more likely to get that subsequent crisis, then the two distributions are much more comparable in the sense that this is the range of possible, the blue are the range of possible outcomes in countries whose central bank intervened at time zero. And the, the yellow uh, are the ranges of possible outcomes in the countries where the central bank did not intervene. And the two distributions here are fairly similar. Actually, the modal uh, outcome is better without intervention relative to the intervention. Okay? So again, um, don't take the numbers of this exercise too seriously. My purpose here was simply check whether the gains are an order of magnitude bigger than the potential risks. And I don't think that's the case. They're more comparable. They're at least of the same order of, uh, of magnitude. Uh, and so this was my second comment. The first comment was instead arguing that uh, uh, there are some concerns about the exogeneity of the instruments. And so uh, that's a little bit of a note of uh, caution. Thank you Sorry very for much, going over Thank you. Morris, you want to discuss? Thank you, George. It's, um, I, I, I can, uh, I'm very happy to see these simulations. I think, um, I think your assumptions about the cost of the second crisis are actually quite severe, even in the mild case. So um, I guess that, that is good news for the, the interventionist camp. Uh, regarding threats to identification, I think, yes. I mean, you, didn't, you were very gracious not even to talk about all the measurement issues and classification issues that, that obviously arise. Uh, I think we can test that second channel, which indeed we did not discuss in the paper. So the idea that in a financial boom, the appointment of a hawkish governor becomes more likely. I think there's ways to at least get a sense for that's in the data. I guess my hunch would be that these appointments follow political schedules. They are like sort of partly predetermined with, I would be surprised if we find much, but it's something we can test. No, I think, and, that, and we'll do that. I mean, maybe leave it for discussion. Thank you. Okay. I Great paper. Uh, uh, one uh, benefit of a lender of last resort facilities, uh, <coughs> preventive, right? Once you have the LRR, you know, since Badgerhot, that actually crisis become less likely because you're eliminating the bad equilibrium. And in fact, Michael Bordo has a very nice paper comparing the UK and the US experiences in late 19th or early 20th century. They had very similar business cycles, but you, the UK had fewer crises, and he argues because UK had a lender of last resort. So I'm wondering, you know, you're showing very nicely that conditional on having a crisis, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lander of last resort is very useful, but 
maybe actually there's additional benefits that you have fewer crises to begin with when you have a dovish um, central bank in place. And I would also note that this actually goes against the moral hazard argument that you know, it's not necessarily the case that you have more crises with dovish. If you, are, if you think of this preventive mechanism as strong enough, it might cut against the moral hazard mm -hmm. arguments. Mm -hmm. Are we collecting or? I, I, I get, yeah, I, I, I t totally agree. I, this is conditional on having one. Uh, I guess you want to balance this against uh, having a dove in charge might increase incentives for risk taking, especially if there's not, the regulation interaction is, is uncertain. But uh, yeah, you know, in theory, maybe in practice, not so much. But it's a good point. Luke? Ah, sorry, Oreste already has the mic, so let's, let's give Oreste. Thank you. Is this, is this what, yeah. Okay, Oreste Tristani, CV. Uh, I was on a very interesting paper. I was wondering about, you said you have a lot of information about these balance sheets uh, as well, the, the central mm -hmm. bank balance sheets as well. And I was wondering whether there's a role played by the duration of the intervention, so how fast the balance sheet mm -hmm. goes back, mm -hmm. and also on, um, on what is on the asset side. You showed, you showed reserves, but I wonder, so some, you know, we know that some expansions of balance sheets involve purchases of government bonds, mm -hmm. but I guess some other ones were more... Uh, you know, on the bank side. Mm. Uh, and, and also a final issue, and I, I was wondering one other measure of whether, okay, not really the effects of moral hazard, moral hazard but maybe the dis potential dissatisfaction with, with uh, what happened with the intervention is, um, could, be, could be gauged on, but from, from, uh, by looking at whether you know, a, a dovish central bank is followed typically by a, a hawkish one. I was wondering whether you, you can see mm. this from the data. And vice versa, of course. Mm -hmm. um, four great questions in one. Um, speed of intervention. Unfortunately, we only have annual data, so that I mean, ideally, you want to say like as quickly as you see trouble emerging, can you see um, difference in the timing having an effect? Um, we don't have that, you know, that that granularity in time. We also just have intervention. I mean, you're told you we have like about 90 intervention or 90 crises, 26 um, with the doves and I think nine with the hawks and with that have seen these interventions. So there's a little bit of a data issue, how, how finely we can cut that. But it's a very interesting point. I'll, we'll look at what we can do. Um, <clears throat> on the asset side, I think we believe that this is mostly private sector assets that, that are bought. Um, but um, the data on the liability side of central bank balance sheet is much better than on the asset side. So we, again, if, I, if we had better, we've looked at it sort of, we don't have the systematic overview. Um, there is another, um, I think, interesting point that I might want to bring in, I think that relates to what you said is, um, we, we also obviously look at the path of interest rates. So to make sure that this is really the effect of the balance sheet expansion and not also of like, you could think that the doves cut interest rates quicker and there's a difference in interest rates, so that's, that's taken care of. Okay. Luke Laven, ECB. Um, I think it's a, it's a very great attempt on an excruciatingly difficult <laughs> identification problem. Um, and one can quibble, of course, about classifications. Like, uh, I think the, the difficulty is people <coughs> change their ideology. I think Mervyn King is a great recent example. Hawk turned dove presiding over the biggest uh, balance sheet expansion in the history of the country. Um, my, my question goes as follows. Do you think it's really the ideology of the governors or of the country? The reason uh. why I'm asking that is that most central banks in history actually are either given an explicit land of last resort mandate or not. Mm. So if, if you go, let's say, to 1900, France, Germany were very different. So France and the UK had, had given their central banks explicit mandates. Um, Germany and the US did not. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was very much influenced by the ideologies in those countries at the time. They later on changed with the establishment of the Fed, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. You, mm. I don't no, know I if you can question. distinguish, but it's, I think, something in terms of really what is causing this, maybe something you would want to look into. Yeah, a great question, Luke. Um, I mean, to some ex so to some extent, there is a, there's a country fixed effects on these on these instrument on on the in the first stage, and that might take care of it a little bit. But then things change in countries over time, and so yeah, um, it's 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 a fair point. I think um, from my reading, 
uh, of history, I would certainly, and, and I refer to colleagues over there, or over there, I don't know where, um, over there, um, in, 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 you know, there might some be some ideological consensus in countries at some point to, that is more, even more important than the governor um, sort of upbringing. Um, you, we, we're making an assumption here, of course, that the governor itself, his, himself, herself, plays a very important role in guiding this and, and is, is, is more than sort of just a, an extension of the consensus reigning in the country. But it's an, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting point. It's a, it's a good point, I agree. Uh, was it, what was the other question? There was a good, you're good, sorry. So the, the Ar Arno and Roland have to go, let's collect them now and maybe if there's a third one. Yeah. So Carlo and then. You can answer. <coughs> so, Arno, so, so I had a related uh, question. Can you, can you <coughs> stand oh, so, up, sorry. please? I had a related question to, to what Luke was, was asking, Moritz. So, it seems that, that, that people uh, um, you know, have difficulties with the, with the, with the instruments. So, I said, why not another instrument? And I thought, do you have information on whether central banks were independent or not mm -hmm. throughout history? Because I thought, um, let's say, you take the case of the Banque de France, no? at least in part of its history, it was receiving instructions from the Treasury, so limiting its ability to act on its own. So if you have variation across central banks or across time within central banks, mm -hmm. you could you know, get an exogenous variation which, which cannot be criticized uh, for being endogenous to restaking because you know, the reason why some central banks became independent was completely remote to any economic considerations in many cases. Mm -hmm. That's why I was thinking of trying that. Holland? Holland, ECB, so great paper. Um, uh, just um, on the moral hazard concern, um, like one well-known uh, um, Precaution no, is also the Badger principle to lend in a crisis um, at a penalty rate and mm -hmm. against good collateral. So that's, uh, that's well known. And I was just wondering whether you can also observe this data in your historical uh, data set so that you can distinguish also uh, between central banks which have uh, in a way respected this uh, Badger principles and those uh, that may have not. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So Lincarno, last question. Uh, Villa from the ECB. No, great paper, thanks. Uh, two uh, quick questions. The first on the identification, I was just thinking that probably the, the important assumption behind the identification is the persistence of beliefs or the governor before and after the appointment. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to understand what is that would make the enforcement of this uh, persistence uh, realized. Uh, today, of course, uh, is the market testing the uh, whatever uh, policymaker says that would move assets in uh, seconds, while I'm not sure that uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, whatever government were say would be tested by any market discipline device. <coughs> so this would probably affect mm -hmm. your results. The second is when you balance short-term gain and long-term pain, whether you also account for you, you have a, a graph that says that, that shows that there is a, a huge increase in investment. Mm -hmm. So now this in paper shows that, for example, a tightening can last, a monetary policy can last uh, about 10 years mm -hmm. with uh, affecting also uh, TFP or the accumulation of knowledge. Know and, whether, it, yeah. Yeah, and whether this is something that you also account for. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe. Maybe you wanted to, this, I mean, there's this, I know you know you're referring to Oscars and Allen's paper on, on, on these long-term effects of monetary policy. Feel free if you want to come in. I will then maybe start with, with Arno and Roland. Um, uh, Central bank independence, we, we cut and checked if that makes a difference for the intervention probability. Didn't, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look closer into this and see Roland, no, we love, we'd love to know, but we don't. Like the exact terms, that's uh, enormous, enormous work. And then, um, I, I, I do, I mean, I, I think this, uh, we, we, we thought about this sort of the governor persistence um, and, and, and believes, we thought about maybe test, looking at the market reaction at the appointment of that governor and see if mostly he is seen as a, as a hog or duff, but it's, it's very difficult with these historical data. But I think it's a good idea. We, we indeed, we do assume that this is kind of hard-coded. You know, you're, you're a hog, you or you, I don't know, you come from the monetarist tradition and you don't change your views even in the evidence of 
other facts. I don't, you know, maybe sometimes that's, that corresponds to reality. Um, I should say before I hand over to, to Jody for last comment, I should say that this actually, this paper grew out of a Sintra paper that I did with Neil, I think in 2014. So thanks to the ECB for really kickstarting that research. No, I don't think I have anything. No, you? Okay. And I think that was a very nice concluding <laughs> remark. No? And that paper generated a big discussion. We can continue that over lunch, but there's two, two more things before. I mean, one is a round of applause for, for the two of you. And the, the second, I mean, Luc Laven opened the conference and I would want to give him the floor to also formally close it. So. All right, so that's, um, it's not closed yet. We still go for lunch all together, but uh, now it's the most important part of the conference, which is to thank those who made it happen. And all of you who have ever organized a conference like this one in your life knows how much is happening behind the scene and behind the curtain. And uh, often it's forgotten, and I don't want to make that mistake today. Um, so we're going to have a few of the colleagues here on stage right now. Um, and uh, it's a little surprise for them because they don't know. <laughs> so that's the fun part. And I want to uh, start with uh, Britta Bertram who um, actually was not even supposed to be in charge of this event, but took over from a sick colleague, which is, of course, uh, the most exemplary way of uh, teamwork you can imagine. Um, so, Britta, please don't be shy. On stage is on stage. Uh, be, do, be careful with the steps. Um, by the way, um, this stage is a little bit holy in uh, the building because normally uh, it's the real important guns that are standing here. And in particular, our president, uh, Christine Lagarde, gives her press conference here. So I'm not sure you realize that. All right, but anyway, let's just continue. All the trainees as well, of course, that have been going around with the microphone, Catalina, everyone, come on stage. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the communications team, whoever has a hand free, I mean, NASA, I know you always do. Others, feel free to come on stage. The camera keeps rolling. We have a whole assistant team, so please come all on stage. And then the last but not least, the organizing committee, uh, Bartosz first and foremost, but this time we had a really large one, and that I think explains why we had such a wonderful collection of papers. So please, Bartosz, Laura, every one of you, please come on stage. <laughs> 